Last week, God called the prophet Jonah and gave him a commission to the wicked city of Nineveh. They were a wicked and cruel people, so wicked that all of heaven knew about them and God wanted to intervene in their lives. There are some commentators who say that, that Jonah was prejudiced against the Gentile people of Nineveh. That being a Hebrew, he really didn't care about them whatsoever, whether they would do well or not do well. It wasn't any of his business. They weren't his people. And there are some who say that Jonah was just plain scared. That these people of Nineveh, were, Nineveh, Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. And Assyria was a very cruel and a very, very vicious army. And they would go into lands, into territory, and just tear them up and kill people and do horrendous things to them. And I imagine Joseph, I mean, see, Jonah is thinking, why do I want to subject myself to that, right? So he takes off. Rather than receiving God's commission, the reluctant prophet Jonah decided to run from God. Silly prophet. The psalmist says in Psalm 139, 7, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? Where can we hide from God, beloved? Now he's on a boat to Tarshish. He decides that he's going to go to the farthest place he's ever heard of. So far away from Nineveh that God will disqualify him from even trying to call him once more to go to Nineveh. Jonah says, I know how to get out of this. I'll just disqualify myself, and God won't call me to do this. And so we see he encounters a storm that is sent by God. The storm was so severe that the scripture tells us in verse 4, the ship was about to be broken up. In our text tonight, Jonah finds out when you run from God, it doesn't take long before you realize you're not running from him, but you're running into him. We cannot escape the Lord. Jeremiah 23, 24 says, Can anyone hide himself in secret places? So I cannot see him, says the Lord. Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? And so we see Jonah is on a... Uh, boat, basically, it would be called predicament. He is in a, a lot here. The, the storm is being upon the ship. God is saying, Jonah, I'm going to take you to Nineveh. You just don't understand that. So as he is running away from God, Jonah is running right into God. So let's begin in our text tonight, starting with verse 6, and then we're going to go to verse 17. So the captain came to him and said to him, what, did, what do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. And they said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. And then they said to him, please tell us for whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation and where do you come from? What is your country and of what people are you? So he said to them, I'm a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he had fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then he said to them, What shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. And he said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to land, but they could not. For the sea continued to grow, to grow more tempestuous against them. Therefore they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life, and do not charge us with innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and they threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. 
Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. We see as Jonah is running from the Lord, he goes down into the lowest part of the ship and there he falls asleep. He's rocked, rocked to sleep by the great storms of life. He doesn't care about the people who are fighting the storm above him on the top of the deck of the ship. He doesn't care about the people of Nineveh, Nineveh who are dying and going to hell. He doesn't care about anybody. He just says, I'm going to go down and just sleep myself through this. In verse 6 through 10, we see the prophet is exposed. They find out the truth of what's happening of the storm. You see, when you're running from God, you only think you're hiding from him. God sees us in all what we do and say. In verse 6 through 8, we see the prophet is confronted. In verse 6, we see the captain goes down below the ship. He starts looking around and all the workers are there and everybody's on the top deck. And he said, no, wait a minute. What about that Jewish guy we picked up at Joppa? Where is he at? And somebody said to him, oh, that guy, he's down, he's down in the bottom of the ship asleep. And he says, not on my boat. <laughs> so he goes down there. I can just see him kicking him. What are you doing? The prophet is confronted. The captain's demand is simple, his call for prudence. In verse 6, the captain came to him and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. We see his call not only for prudence, but we see his call for prayer. He's saying all of us are working our fingers to the bone. We're doing everything we can. It's a dangerous job. These waves are coming over the ship. And here you are sleeping downstairs. The best you could do for us, at least pray for us. And so we see this is a plea from a lost man. This is a plea from not a member of the, of the family of God. When all else fails, Christian, he says, pray for us. So we need to be there to pray, beloved, when people need the prayers that we are to offer. Do you realize that you could be an intercessor for lost people today? That no matter where you go, there are people at the grocery store, there are people at the market, there are people at the uh, mall who need your prayers. Years ago, I was working at a place uh, there in Glenbrook Mall, it was called Family Bookstore. It was placed there by the Zondervan Corporation. Mr. Zondervan had started a bookstore. He and his brother, they'd come back from the war. They took $100, went to New York and bought $100 worth of books, opened a bookstore up in their bedroom there in Grand Rapids, Michigan. It became a huge place. It was unbelievable. But they had a store in another mall, and, and that store was, we'd always play Christian, tells you how long ago this was, Christian LPs. <laughs> And we'd have the record player there in the front of the store. We'd play this music. Well, a lady had gone to one of the great malls up north, and she'd gotten up on that third floor, and she had decided to end her life by jumping off the third, the third balcony and, and falling to the rocks below. But suddenly the music in the Zondervan store caught her ear. And she said, that's the most beautiful music I've ever heard. And she said, I'll come back after I go in and listen to that, and then I'll jump. And so she went back into the store and, and was listening to the music. She came up to the manager and said, that is the most beautiful music I have ever heard. And he said, oh, you must be a Christian. She said, no, I'm not. And he ended up leading her to the Lord. And she said to him, you know, I was going to kill myself tonight, but the music touched my soul. Oh, folks, listen, what music can we be to the heart of men and women today? You and I can touch the lives of other people. You and I can pray for those in need. I pray for our church each and every day. I don't know what to pray for you. I really don't. I don't have an insight. God doesn't reveal to me all the things you're going through or what you shouldn't be going through. But the Lord tells me sometimes to pray for people, and I do. 
Sometimes I pray for our church members. Sometimes I pray for non-church members. Sometimes I pray for... Folks, we need to understand we are here for a purpose. We are here for a purpose. You and I are just not here to float through the a life and go through the storms like Jonah and sleep through the storms. We are here to support and to share and to give the hope of Christ to men and women today. We see the captain's demand. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 1 says, Therefore I exhort, first of all, that supplications prayers, intercessions, and the giving of thanks be made for all men. Paul told Timothy, you pray for everybody. You pray for Christians and non-Christians alike. We need to pray for all those people at work that we work with that are not Christians. We know they're not Christians. We know that by their speech, we know that by their actions, but we can pray for them. And you know God will draw them to us. And God will, draw, will make their hearts soft that we can speak to them about the things of God. Jonah didn't understand that right off. Here he was sleeping in the bottom of the ship. In verse 7 and 8, we see the crew's discernment. In verse 7, look at the sailors casting. The Bible says very simply, And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Oh, that, that's a wonderful lottery that Jonah won, huh? <laughs> Jonah said, I didn't even buy a ticket. <laughs> we see Jonah here. He's down in the ship. He probably comes up the top, and they get these. They got a little a container that has certain rocks in it. And all the rocks are one color except one, and they decide that they're going to to do this. You know, this is a very interesting thing. The casting of lots by mixing small stones in a container. It says in Ryrie Study Bible that, that they took one out and was a popular form of divination. It was used both by pagans and Hebrews. Well, even the early church used lots. In, in Acts chapter 1 and verse 26, the Bible says, and they cast their lots. And the lot fell on Mattathias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. And so it was their way. What it was like is it, it was like the Urim and Thummim there in the Old Testament that the high priest had in, his, in the, the container of his uh, breastplate. And the stones, it was one was black and the other one was white. And so what they do, one meant yes and the other meant no. And the, and the high priest would bring in to get an answer. If God would not speak to him literally, he would get the answer by doing that. And so what we see is they were making this determination by Lot and praying to God, give, we're God, and saying, hey, give us an understanding. And the Lot fell on Jonah. The finger pointed toward him. That big finger of, of problems and said, you're the one, was pointed to him. And so we see the sailors casting. There's no doubt who's the problem. There's no doubt who's caused the storm. There's no doubt who's caused all this injury. And the question is very simply, why, Jonah? Why are you doing this to us? The captain said, you know, what have you done? We see in verse 8 the sailors' concern. And then they said to him, please tell us. For whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation? And where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? We see they become very personal, don't they? You see, when trouble comes into the lives of people, people get very personal about this. And they want to know, what in the world is this trouble? You're the new guy on the block. Maybe you're the one causing all of this. Now the, the, the lots have fallen on you. In Isaiah chapter 57, verse 20 and uh, 21, the Bible says, But the wicked are like the troubled sea, when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. We live in a world of sin because we are all sinners. And our sin affects the lives of other people. Jonah here ran from God. Jonah here said no to God. 
Jonah here said, I'm, there's no way, shape, and form. I'm going to disqualify myself. I'm going to go the opposite direction. And God, you're going to have to call somebody else. Here am I, send someone else. And what we see is Jonah here is the one who's caused all these problems. And the lost people have seen that. You know, there are so many Christian people who have caused so many heartaches and caused so many troubles among the world. There are people that said, if that's what a Christian is like, I don't ever want to be one. And you know, that's a tragedy. That's a tragedy. I, I've heard people all my life, my brother used to tell me, I love Jesus, I just don't love hypocritical people. And he would tell me the church is a bunch of hypocrites. I almost said one time, well, why don't you come? We got room for one more, but I didn't. But the bottom line is simple, folks. As a Christian, we have a way of affecting the lost world. Now, that affecting the lost world can be a positive way or it can be a negative way. But we need to purpose in our lives to always show the grace of God in our life. There are those people who have become so, so evil and so ugly as Christians uh, that they have besmirched the name of Jesus. We see the crew's discernment and the captain's demand. The prophets confronted. Jonah had that big bony finger pointed at him and said, you're the one. We see in verse 9 and 10 the prophet's confession. In verse 9 we see the admission of the sleeper. He says in verse 9, so he said to them, I'm a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. One of the most interesting commentaries I was reading this, this week talked about that, that term, who made the sea and the dry land. And they said that in the ancient world, one of the most interesting things about their gods is if it had some type of contact with the sea. That he was a major god in all the pantheons of gods. And Jonah said something that really kind of per uh, perked their interest when he said this in verse 9. He said, again, the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. The sea was probably the, one of the most unpredictable things in the lives of mariners. Sometimes the sea could be very smooth sailing. Sometimes the ocean could be a wonderful uh, road to take them to another place for commerce or, or for visiting. But oh, sometimes a storm could come upon them. Now imagine a world where they didn't have the Doppler radar. Imagine a world where they didn't have satellites that could predict the movement and all these things. Imagine how much tragedy could be in this thing called uh, the mariners who basically made their living going from place to place. And so for a God who took care of the sea, for a God who made the sea, they, they kind of perked their interest. And we see that Jonah somehow had gotten their attention very much in verse 9. We see his specific citizenship. He said, I'm a Hebrew. I'm a Hebrew. I'm a child of God. Oh, beloved listener, people are going to say to you, are you a Christian? And you need to answer yes. You need to answer yes. I'm a born-again Christian. I'm a child of God. And then we see he gives a sober confession here in verse 9. He says in verse 9, I fear the Lord, the God of heaven. He said, I, I fear the Lord, but I'm running. And that's why I'm running, because I fear the Lord is going to send me to my doom and to my death. And we see his sober confession, and we see his sovereign creator. He said, the God who made the heavens, or excuse me, the sea and, and the dry land. In Proverbs 14, 27, the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the fountain of life, turning a man from the snares of death. Oh, beloved, think about that. The Bible says, you know, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Jonah feared the Lord, but you see, it didn't drive him to follow the Lord. The fear of the Lord in Jonah's sake was simple. I'm going to get on a ship and I'm going to go to the farthest place away from him and I'm going to disqualify myself from this position. He was a prophet. He was called by God to be a prophet. He was a man who was set apart by God to go and do the things that God had commissioned him to do. 
but he had changed his profession. He went from prophet to runner. He went from prophet to a person who would escape from the land of God and the people of God. And then we see also in verse 10, the admission of the sailors. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, why, why have you done this? For the men knew that he had fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. The writer of the book of Jonah, which was Jonah, he did not say at this point in time all the different things. He went into more things about what he was doing. I'm sure he talked about the Ninevites. Ninevites. I'm sure he said, you, you know those people. Yeah, we do. And they're evil, aren't they? Yes, they are. Well, I'm not going to talk to them. And I'm sure they said, well, I don't blame you. <laughs> but you see, it wasn't them who called him. It was God who called them. And so we see the consideration of Jonah's course. In verse 10, they were afraid for him. Why have you done this? Who would turn against their own God? How foolish is that? They had heard stories about the gods of the Egyptians. They'd heard the stories of the gods of the, of the uh, Greeks and of the gods of all the other people around them. And they knew that they were evil gods. They knew these gods were gods of vengeance. They knew these gods were gods that would take uh, terrible prices upon these people because of their disobedience. But they did not understand that the God of the Hebrews was the King of kings and Lord of lords and his Presence brought mercy and grace. What they were used to was evilness of the gods. You know, these demonic creatures. I believe that these people worship demonic creatures. I believe they bowed down to images that they had seen and made to look like what they had seen. And these people had seen horrible things. And these things were evil. And these things were very bitter and very angry. But we have a God who loves we have a God who has mercy. And God was still wanting to show Jonah his mercy. God was willing to show God, uh, Jonah his love. And so we see their consideration of Jonah's course. Why, why are you doing this? What a question to ask him. Why have you done this? And then we see their conclusion of Jonah's confidentiality. They knew that he fled from his presence. And oh, they must have thought, well, what, God do they, what God was going to do to him? What other God was going to interfere? What other God was going to do this? You see, they had such a pantheon of different gods that this God of, of uh, the sea, this God of the air, this God of the, of the lightning, this God of the earthquake, this God, they had all times of, types of gods. And they were wondering what other God is going to interfere or, or to uh, bring justice upon Jonah. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 31 says, he is a fearful th it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Oh, beloved, Jonah was playing the wrong game. He was going to lose. You never win when you seek to run from God. You never win when you seek to say no to God. There are people all my life I have interviewed have come to my office and did counseling there down in Florida who would tell me the same thing. I, I've run from God as a young man. God called me to do this or God called me to do that and I'm running from them and I don't know how to go back. We see Jonah is in, in this ship of fools and they are literally on a, a, a voyage of danger and death. In verses 11 through 16, we see the prophet is expelled. The prophet is expelled. Jonah was expelled right into the hands of God. <laughs> Again, when you run from God, you don't run from him, you run into him. And Jonah, as his child, as his prophet, was going to run smack dab into the God of this universe. We see the perplexity of the situation in verse 11 and 12. Look at verse 11, the appeal of the pagans. So what should they do? Verse 11, then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? 
They're getting ready to throw him under the bus, gang. They're getting ready to say, hey, if you're doing this and if you don't mind, we're just going to take care of this. What do we need to do? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. The sea was growing stronger. The storm was growing stronger each and every moment as they talked about this reluctant prophet who was running from God. We see the request of the sailors. What an opportunity for Jonah. He now has an occasion to repent and to witness to these sailors. He has an opportunity to show these sailors the mercy of God. How God can have mercy on Jonah can have mercy on them. He has an opportunity to tell them about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. About how we can fall into sin and God can forgive. We see Jonah's opportunity, but we understand he's not going to take that. We see the raging of the sea that... The Bible says it continues to become tempestuous. It t continues to grow worse. It continues to overflow upon the ship, and these men don't know what to do. The answer of the prophet was simple in verse 12, and he said to him, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you, for I know that this great tempest is because of me. We see Jonah's carnal resignation. <laughs> Once again, Jonah is trying to seek to escape God's sovereign will. You see, if I can't go to Tarshish, if I can't go to the farthest end of the world and get away from God, then I'll just die. <laughs> just throw me in the water, I'll drown, and I won't have to go to Nineveh. Oh, I'll go to Sheol, I'll go to the place where all the prophets go when they die, and I'll go to that place and I'll wait for the judgment of God, but guess what? I won't have to go to Nineveh. His heart was still against God's will. And there are those people who say, I will never do what you ask me to do. We see Jonah's carnal resignation. But we see Jonah's confession of responsibility also in verse 12. We see Jonah says, I know this is because of me. You see, if Jonah's confession is of repentance, or is it just mere acknowledgement of his sin? You see, true confession is recognition of sin, remorse of sin, and repentance of sin. But there was not any remorse of his sin there was not any repentance of his sin. There was only recognition. I'm a sinner against my God. In Psalm chapter 139 and verse 8, 7 and 8, it says, Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. Oh, poor old Jonah, he said, I don't care if I go to heaven or go to hell. I just want to say no to Nineveh. I don't want to do this. I don't want to go to this place. I don't want to take the chance. So I'm willing to die here right now for my beliefs. We see the pursuit of the sovereign in verse 13 through 16. We see their efforts of futility. In verse 13 and 14, we see how they've tried to help poor old Jonah. In verse 13, it says, Nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to land, but they could not. For the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. We see in verse 13, their plight of frustration. Oh, they thought, no, we don't want to kill somebody on our behalf just because we're having problems. We'll make it to the shore. We'll get to the shore. We'll pull hard. We'll, we'll, we'll uh, row our way back to the shore. And we'll not throw this man into the sea. Proverbs 21, 30 says, There is no wisdom, no insight, no plan that can succeed against the Lord. You see, God said, I want him to go to the place I want to go. Probably the nearest land wasn't the land that was connected to uh, their Israel. But rather, it was probably a, 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 an island or something nearby, away from where Jonah was supposed to go. 
But we see their flight, their plight, excuse me, of frustration. These sailors were honorable people. Despite the lots and Jonah's admission, they tried to row to safety without throwing him overboard. They did not want to be guilty of a man's blood. They did not want to be guilty of killing a man, especially a prophet of God who made the sea and the dry land. These people were fearful where Jonah was not. These people were more fearful of the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, more so than Jonah was. We see their plight of frustration, but look at their prayer for forgiveness in verse 14. They're going to the right place. Therefore they cried out to the Lord, didn't say to their Lord, didn't say to their God. They cried out to the Lord, Jonah's God. And said, we pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life. And do not charge us with innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. Oh, they had more spirituality than old Jonah did. They went to the source of Jonah's trouble. They went to the source of their trouble, which was the storm. And they went to God. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Oh, these people were in need. And they chose to go to Jonah's God. They chose not to throw him overboard, but they said, let's, let's go to their, his God and let's pray. Let's bring honor and glory to him. We see in verse 15 and 16 their experience of faith. Again, in verse 15 and 16, God allows good to come out of Jonah's sinful rebellion. All of this God knew was going to happen. There is nothing that takes God by surprise. There is nothing that God does not know ahead of time. He knows the choices we'll make. He knows the direction we'll go. He'll know what we're doing against him or for him. We see in verse 15 their recognition of the sovereign. These pagans, so to speak, they recognize the sovereignty of the God of Jonah. Look at verse 15. The Bible says, So they picked up Jonah, and they threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. We see their recognition of the sovereignty of God. They must have realized, since we can't make it to the shore, since the storm does not abate, since the storm increases in intensity, since Jonah has told what we think is the truth, then we must do what God has asked him to do. And so we see the recognition of their sovereign. In Psalm 107, verse 28, the Bible says, Then they cry out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brings them out of their distress. Oh, they cried out to the God of Jonah, the Bible tells us in verse 15. And they threw him into the sea. Verse 16, we see the revival of the sailors. In verse 16, the Bible says, Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Now there are people, commentators I read said these people had not given any indication that they had become a believer in the Hebrew God of Jonah. But there are others who say just the opposite. For example, I was reading in one of the commentaries that quoted Rabbi Rashi, who lived between 1040 and 1105. And he said they vowed to convert. They said as soon as they get back to land, they're going to convert to the Hebrew God of Jonah. They took vows in Job 28, 28, the Bible says unto man, he said, behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. Oh, beloved, it's something to see when lost people are confronted with our God. It's something to see even in our time of trouble, they see the hand of God in the lives of themselves as well as Jonah. And so they turned to him. In conclusion, we see in Jonah 1.17, the Savior's fish. 
Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. You see, it was prepared by God. It was a special fish prepared by the, for the prophet. Note two basic things about God's fish. Again, it was a prepared fish. Jeremiah chapter 32 and verse 28 says, And to the man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord is the wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. Yes. But in verse 27 of, verse, of chapter 32, it says, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? You remember the, the, the biblical text about Mary, when Mary said, How can I have a child when I don't know a man? And the Bible says very simply, With God, all things are possible. So would it be possible that God created one fish, one great fish, prepared enough to swallow this one reluctant prophet that a whole city of pagan people would be saved? I believe so. A great fish prepared for this rebellious prophet for God's sovereign mercy and purpose? That word prepared in the Hebrew text is the word designated. I like that. This fish was not only prepared by God, not only he created a great fish, but he designated that great fish for one person. He said, I made it for Jonah. You know, sometimes God makes our own fish for us. Sometimes God allows for certain things to come into our lives that he's prepared not to destroy us. That fish wasn't sent to destroy Jonah. He lasted and lived three days and three nights in that fish. If God wanted to destroy him, he would have sent a, a killer whale. <laughs> he would have sent some evil creature to come and to, and to kill him. But he sent that special fish, that special fish to take Jonah. It was not only a prepared fish, but it was also a prophetic fish. You see, this great fish was prepared illustration for Jesus concerning the prophecy of his death and his resurrection. When they challenged Jesus one day, they said, but what authority do you do this? And Jesus said, as Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the earth. This fish not only had a purpose for Jonah, but this fish also had a purpose for Jesus, that he might say, I was able to use this man's problem, that he chose to ignore God, that he chose to run from God, he chose to disobey God, but I can use that same instance to say, I'm not going to run. I'm going to go to the city of Nineveh. I'm going to seek and to save that which was lost. And Jesus went to the cross for us. We see Jonah. He's run from God, but he's run right into him, <laughs> right into God. And God says, you're right where I want you, Jonah. I'm going to give you a fish ride. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity you've given us. We thank you for your word. Father, we thank you for the illustration of Jonah. And how Jesus took this man's testimony, this testimony of disobedience, this testimony of running from God, and taking it and using it to bring honor and glory to him, talking about his resurrection. Oh, Father God, would that all our problems would become solutions for the Lord. Would everything we say and do that is contrary to the word of God and to God himself be forgiven and placed as far as the east from the west to be remembered no more. And, oh, Father God, be with us as we travel in this old world that if you choose us to tell, if you choose us to sin, if you choose us to say, that we would not be reluctant, but we would be faithful. And, oh, Father God, be with us as we prepare for this time of decision, that if there be anyone here tonight who's lost without Christ, if there be anybody watching on YouTube, Father, that are lost without Christ, 
that this would be their opportunity, this would be their day, this would be uh, the opportunity for them to receive the Lord as their Savior. Help them to understand, Father God, we're all sinners. Each and every one of us, everyone born into this world are sinners. And oh, Father God, we thank you that though we are sinners, there is a Savior. And we thank you, Father, that each and every one of us are in this boat. And the tragedy is the boat is sinking. Death is coming. But oh, there are those of us in the boat, Father, that have the, the life preserver of Jesus. That he's come to seek and to save that which was lost. And we received him as our Savior. And though death is coming, life is coming too. And oh, Father God, help them understand that Jesus is the Son of God. And that he died for their sins as well as our sins. And that he rose from the dead to give them life everlasting. If they would believe that and trust in that. And accept it, Father God, as their punishment of evil sin that they've committed. That Jesus has taken their punishment for them. And that they could invite Jesus into their heart that they might be saved. They might be born again. Let them pray something like this. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I confess and repent of my sins right now. And I thank you, Jesus, that you died for each and every one of them. And that you rose from the dead to give me life everlasting. I believe this, Lord. Now I ask that you come into my heart and save my soul and to the best of my ability. I'll live the rest of my life for you, Jesus. Thank you. As we continue in prayer, those who prayed that prayer, if they would come tonight and make it public, Jesus would say, I'll acknowledge you. And there might be those who are watching on YouTube and they could not come on a church service, but they could tell a family member or a friend that they received Christ. Jesus said, if you'll acknowledge me before men, I'll acknowledge you before the Father. Father God, speak to hearts tonight. Let no one leave this place or turn off the the YouTube without coming to Christ. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi, my name is John Blair, and I have the privilege of being the pastor here at Coventry Baptist Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I want to thank you for choosing to take part in our online services. I sincerely hope they were a blessing to you, and I want to invite you to continue to use them in the weeks yet ahead. In fact, take your time on our website, check it out, let us know what you think about it. Your opinion is very important to us, and we'd like to have some feedback. Let me take this time to also extend an invitation to you. If you don't already have a church home, let me invite you to come to our church and take part in one of our weekly services. Our morning worship service on Sunday is at 10 a.m., our Sunday night service is at 6 p.m. And our Wednesday services and our midweek service is at 7 o'clock p.m. We're located at 10926 Aboit Center Road. We're right across the street from Homestead High School. Uh, just get on our website. We have a detailed map and some instructions on how to get here. Again, Thank you for choosing our website and our services. I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you. I hope to see you this Sunday. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love.